Uh, let me just explain what we're going to be looking at. It's not quite science of the times. What we're looking at is trying to piece together a sequence of events that we believe will happen from the return of the Lord Jesus to the final establishment of the Kingdom of God. And so we'll be piecing together many of the prophecies which are given in Scripture. And probably many of you might be aware of the book my father wrote, Way to Jerusalem, which was reprinted as World Events from the Coming of Zion's King, where my father set out uh, a very extensive sequence of events, and that is the pattern that we shall be following. So, you want to get in there without anything? <coughs> That's already. Um, so the, the first part is to look at events which cover from the return of the Master to the invasion of Israel and the Armageddon. And then the second part is uh, looking at the sequence of events which take place after Armageddon when the world is brought to subjection. Now this is a, a continuous talk and so we will stop half, roughly halfway through. So we might not necessarily even get to that part, or we may even get beyond that, the beginning of that part, but let, let's see what comes. So first of all, I want to consider three areas of events which have to take place before the coming of the Lord Jesus. i just put the three up there. As you can see, they're blank. They're blank for a reason because there are no events that I know of that have to take place before the coming of the Lord Jesus. And that is a very sobering exhortation, brothers and sisters, that we're living right at the end of the days. Uh, we know there are lots of things still to take place, but they can all happen in that time period between the coming of the Lord Jesus and the invasion of Israel. So we really are living at the time of the end. And as I say, I don't know of any event that has to take place before the Lord Jesus comes back to his household. And what we'll be looking at is based upon uh, our traditional understanding of the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation is a book of symbols which unfold to us uh, historical things down through time uh, in a sequence, but not necessarily from chapter 1 to chapter 20, beautifully designed to span periods and then a picture of the time of the end and then another span, a picture of the time of the end. So wherever our brothers and sisters were living, they would always have a vision of the end close to the events of their own time. And this is what we call continuous historic exposition. One of the great advantages of our understanding is it gives us a true understanding of the position of the Roman Catholic Church. This is a system which is against Christ, it is an evil system, and will be destroyed. But this is the system that will rally Europe together to fight against the Lord Jesus when he comes again. And just as they criticised the Jews for rejecting the Messiah when he first came, so we know that Christianity, led by the Catholic Church, will reject the Lord Jesus just as firmly when he comes the second time. And the beauty of this understanding of the book of Revelation is that it complements the Old Testament. The Old Testament is mainly dealing with matters to do with God's people, the nation of Israel, and their history. But when we come to the book of Revelation, then it's giving us matters which concern not so much Israel, but God's people, the saints, and their problems that they faced down through the centuries, the periods of persecution and uh, very difficult times in the money. We're very fortunate to live in a time when we have great freedom. And so the revelation is looking at matters to do with Ecclesiastes. Now, all I'm going to say about the many new ideas which float around our community, which are not really new, they have their roots in the uh, Middle Ages. But there is, within our community, unfortunately, a lot of spiritualising of the Old Testament prophecies. 
so that they no longer deal with the nation of Israel, the literal nation. We as a community are losing sight of the hope of Israel. But they are God's people. And God knew that they would reject the Messiah. They would need to be punished. But God knew that in the end, with the events that are going to unfold upon Israel, that the remnant who survived that terrible persecution will be holy and give honour and praise to him, and under the wise rulership of the twelve disciples, they will be a holy and a righteous people. And so we shouldn't spiritualise these prophecies. They are to do with the literal nation of Israel. Now, there are two concepts uh, about Revelation, either that was mainly filled, fulfilled by AD 70, or stretching forward to, to the time of Constantine, or, and the most popular idea, um, put forward by quite a few within that community is that the main part of the book of Revelation belongs to the future of a three and a half year period of great tribulation. Um, but the majority of the chapters are not having their fulfillment until some future time. And the pre trist and the futurist are the two ideas then. If we just put a, a, a timeline there, we can see the great difference. The, the pre trist is saying, well, Revelation all fulfills by the time we get to Constantine. Uh, the futurist would have it nearly all dealing with some future time. Whereas the continuous historic, it is meant that the book of Revelation has been of use to brothers and sisters down through the ages of all times. There's been a message, they can see where they are, and they have these wonderful visions that the kingdom won't be far away. And it wasn't far away. The kingdom of God is as near as our death, isn't it, brothers and sisters? The vital difference between the futurist ideas and our continuous historic, if it will move on, is the position the resurrection. Our traditional understanding has the resurrection and the judgment of the saints as the first event of a series of events that will unfold at the return of Christ. In other words, before the Gogian invasion, before the nations of Ezekiel 38 come down into the land, the resurrection will have taken place, the judgment will have taken place. Whereas the more modern idea is seem to indicate that the resurrection and the judgment for the saints takes place after the Christ has come and saved the Jews from their enemies. And of course the, the vital difference between the two is our anticipation. If we're looking to see Israel invaded uh, and then those uh, invaders destroyed before we're called to judgment, then we're looking at a world quite differently from one that says the master can come tonight because uh, we're not going to see the invasion of Israel this side of the judgment seat. Well, let's stick to our traditional understanding and just try and piece together the things that will happen. So, as far as we're concerned, the first thing that happens is the re- this the, not only the resurrection, um, but the judgment. And again, this isn't uh, a matter which we talk about very much as brothers and sisters in our community today. We try to uh, shy away from the judgment seat, and some would say, well, there won't be a judgment seat because only those that are called to the resurrection, to the, um, to the return Lord, um, are going to be the ones that go into the kingdom. So there won't be a physical judgment of rights and wrongs. And yet the scriptures are so clear, and we're just going to put two on to the screen there. Incidentally, I've got copies of all the slides, so you can have copies of the slides. Um, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And that is uh, very clear in 2 Corinthians 5. And again, Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 10 and 12. Why does thou judge thy brother? Or why does thou say that? No, my brother. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So that, that's uh, quite a, a sobering aspect, isn't it, brothers and sisters? We are responsible for the lives that we have lived. 
And we all have to answer for the things that we have done. And we rely very much upon the mercy and the goodness of God. And so the vital question, you know, is it before the Gokian invasion or is it after the invasion? I think the Lord Jesus himself tells us very clearly. Because in Revelation chapter 16, having described how the spirits are preparing the nations to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, and then he says he gathers them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, uh, Armageddon. And sandwiched between those two verses is the verse, Behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And that surely clearly tells us that the coming of the Lord Jesus is before the events of Armageddon. It is at a time when the nations are preparing, they are hating Israel and wanting to get rid of her, and we see that very much today. But before they're actually drawn down into the land against God's people, God draws them there. Jesus tells them, I'm going to come as a thief. So it clearly indicates, I think answers uh, any query, when the judgment is going to take place, it is before the invasion of Israel. So um, that's what that says. Now, what do we mean by the return of the Lord Jesus? Um, there are different aspects to that concept, the return of the Lord Jesus. And this uh, couple of verses in 1 Peter chapter 4 is quite an important starting point. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall be the end? Be, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, I'm in all fairness, when Peter wrote these words, he was addressing the disciples about the coming judgments in AD 70. But I don't think we're stretching scripture at all to also apply this as a principle that, first of all, God judges his household. Then there is judgment upon other people. So, I, I see that there are three aspects. When we talk about the return of the Lord Jesus, um, don't misunderstand me, he's not coming back three times, but there are three different aspects. There's this aspect that we're concerned with, his return to uh, judge his household, but he is coming back in judgments against his people Israel. And um, that's something that unfolds after the judgment on his household. And in carrying out his uh, judgment upon his people, his nation, and then that will affect the Gentile nations. Uh, so a third aspect is the return of Christ to judge the world. Can you see that? Are you right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, three different uh, scenarios in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to put a time frame, if I may. Just, uh, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this at all, but just a suggestion that from Christ's return to his household to the uh, return to his nation uh, is a period of ten years. And we're going to fill that out in a moment. <coughs> Uh, and uh, that merges into judgments upon the world because in coming to save his nation he's going to pour judgments against the Gentiles who have come against his land and those judgments will then extend out worldwide until all the nations submit to him. Uh, and I submit that we've got a 40 year period there making a, a 50 year total. Now, let's just deal with the 50 year Aspect, which is, of course, a jubilee period. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 40, where we have the details of the temple. And the interesting thing that when Ezekiel is revealed the temple, he's not revealed the temple being built or constructed. He is taken to this temple yet to be when it's fully functioning. He sees it as a fully functioning temple. And in verse 1 it says, 
in the 5 and 20th year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was smitten, in the south same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither, and it is then reveals uh, the details of the Now, um, this uh, passage, this, this day, this uh, tenth day of the, the month, the beginning of the year, this of course was the day when the Passover lambs were penned up, when they were selected and penned up. Now, 50 years from the chronology, 50 years earlier, we have Josiah's great Passover. And Jewish tradition tells us that that great Passover coincided with one of the Jubilee years. And so if Josiah's um, Passover was a Jubilee year, then it was a Jubilee year, the next Jubilee year, upon this tenth day of the month, that Ezekiel was shown this temple. And it says this self-same day, as if there's some importance about this particular date. Now, if my speculation is correct, um, we're 50 years on, it's hinting that there's going to be a jubilee period involved in the events which will end up with a fully functioning um, temple being established. A 50-year period. Let's just look at this 10 year period. Now, the events that have to take place, we're going to look at the moment. I just want to just lay this as a framework. Come with me to Leviticus chapter 23. I say I'm not going to be dogmatic um, about these, uh, but this is the way I see these things. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, Leviticus 23, verse 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. And do no so of our work, and jump on to verse 27. Also, on the tenth day of this month, so we've got the first day, now we've got to the tenth day of the seventh month. There shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, etc. So, the first day was the blowing of trumpets, and the, we associate blowing of trumpets with the symbol of resurrection. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall rise. The tenth day is the day of atonement, the covering for sins. And I think this is very appropriate for the saving of God's people. Generations have gone by, mainly unfaithful Jews. But in the events which are to unfold, we're going to, as I say, have a righteous and a holy nation. And if this is the case, then if we apply a day for a year, from the first day to the tenth day, and that will give us a, a, a ten-year period from the blowing of the trumpets, the preparing and the calling of the saints, and the judgment of the saints, um, to the saving of Israel. A ten-year period. Well, say, I'm not going to uh, be dogmatic. Um, so the forty-year period, um, which spans the, the uh, saving of the Jews and the uh, establishment of the kingdom and the return of all the Jews back to their land, well, there are three passages which liken the events of the future to the events of the past, the 40 years wilderness journey. I, I again have to admit it doesn't say uh, the, the, number, the same number of years as in the past, it just says as in the time of the past. So uh, Micah says there, according to the days of thy coming out of Egypt will I show unto him marvellous things. Uh, Jeremiah 1 says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will no more be said, 
the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but Yahweh liveth that brought them back from the north south east of west. And the Isaiah 1 is, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. This is all the places they're going to come back. So as I say, it doesn't specifically say a 40 year period, but it, it, it says there is a parallel between the events which are to unfold with events of the past. And it seems very reasonable that God, knowing uh, from the beginning what his work was, had a 40 year period for the Jews in the wilderness and is going to repeat a similar situation. A 40 year period so all the Jews have come back and all the Gentiles have submitted to the rule of Christ. There is a New Testament one, let's just turn to that one, Revelation chapter 14. It clearly uh, points to this uh, time period, it's talking about the judgments and uh, in verse 15 it's talking about a harvesting of the earth and a sickle being needed and then there's another harvest in verse 18 which is of the clusters of the vine and uh, in Israel uh, all around the world uh, your corn grows and develops and is harvested quite a few months before the vines are ready and so these two judgments, the corn harvest, we equate with the events that are going to take place around Israel, the saving of Israel and the destruction of the Gogin forces in Armageddon. And the vine harvest yeah, relates to the judgments that are going to take place upon Europe. And the key is in... Um, Verse 20, the winepress shall be trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridle, so to that height, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's nearly two hundred miles. So, this obviously is some pop. I uh, couldn't have blood that deep, stretching two hundred miles. But it's interesting that. 1,600 stay here. If we square 40, um, 40 times 40, we get 1,600. So, is this a measure of time? That it's not the quantity of blood, it's the duration it's telling us about. 40 years of judgment. Well, um, it, it whether these time periods are going to be right it remains to be seen. It doesn't basically affect what we're going to be looking at. So I just want to quickly just put through a, a, a summary of the sequence of events. So we've got a framework to latch on to and then we can develop it down. So the return of Jesus, the first event is the resurrection and the judgment of the saints. And then I believe that Elijah and Malachi chapter 3 and 4 has a, a work to do uh, amongst the Jews who are in the land at the moment to prepare them for the terrible times that uh, lie ahead. And that will be followed uh, well, during that period. Israel is very prosperous, as Ezekiel 38 talks about. And then comes the invasion by the Gogit nations when the countries of Russia and Europe combine with Pope as their spiritual leader and the military might of Russia to come down to get rid of these Jews and to take Jerusalem to be their headquarters uh, and to show that Christianity will triumph over this Jewish religion. And as a nation, uh, this time is clear from uh, various prophecies of him that Israel as a nation is destroyed in this invasion. Then follows Armageddon, when uh, the faithful remnants in Israel cry out to their God, God will hear. The saints have been prepared. Christ and the saints come up and save um, the Jews. And the earthquake and all the events there. And the Lord Jesus establishes the nucleus of the kingdom in Israel, 
with those Jews baptized into the water that comes out of the fountains that flows out from Zion. And then there will be the call to the Jews to come back. And this is Elijah's second word, to gather all the Jews in to their land. And in parallel with that, there is warfare in Europe. Uh, the nations have to submit and hand their crowns to the king. Some will willingly do it, others will fight to the death. But eventually all nations will submit. And so if you can read right down to the bottom there, <laughs> can't even move that along. Um, and then the kingdom is fully established. So, let's go back to the place of judgment, and I believe that Sinai is that place. <coughs> Where else is there? It's just the most fitting place. Because it was at Sinai that the nation of Israel became God's people. They didn't inherit the land at that stage, but they became God's people. Had to wait 40 years before they inherited the land, but they became a kingdom of kings and priests, uh, well, king, a kingdom of priests, sorry, and a holy nation. Uh, and our hope as spiritual Israel is to become kings and priests. Uh, and so, what more fitting place than Sinai to be the place for this judgment? Uh, a, a repetition of what happened in the time past. Now, there are three passages which uh, support this idea that the judgment is at Sinai, so that Christ comes from Sinai to Jerusalem to save his people. Um, Deuteronomy 33, verses 1 to 5, Psalm 68, which we read, and Habakkuk chapter 3. Well, we'll we'll just look at the the Psalm 68, because they're all parallel. And it, it really just hinges around one verse in that uh, Psalm 68, though it's a wonderful psalm, that's why we read um, most of it, a uh, thrilling psalm. But the key verse is um, in verse 17, which in the authorised version says the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. And if you've got uh, more than the Authorised version, you will see many of those letters are in italics. If we knock out all those italic words, because they're not in the original, then we get what we've got there. The chariots of God, 20,000, thousands of angels, the Lord among them, Sinai into the holy. The bystander version puts from Sinai into the holy place. So the, the idea is of movement coming from Sinai and going to the holy place. Now, why the translators put the word angels there, I do not know. This is the only occurrence of this particular word. Um, And it's got nothing to do with angels, malak, that's a normal word. So this word just occurs once, and it means change ones. Um, The root from which this word comes is used three times. One of them is Joseph. Joseph changed his Romans. So we get the idea that changing is what it's about. So, with that in mind, um, when we reread it, the chariots of God, 20,000, thousands of changed ones, the Lord among them, from Sinai into the holy place. Then we have this dramatic picture of a multitude with the Lord Jesus, of changed ones made him all, ready to go to deliver God's people. And we just note that the Israel didn't go from Sinai to Jerusalem in the time of Exodus. It eventually get to Jerusalem, but not to possess it. Jebusites were still there. Um, so this is a future picture. Um, so this is explaining, giving us a reason why we think the judgment seat should take place at Sinai. Now, how we called, and what happens to our children, is a, a very serious question of one that troubles those with young families. Well, let's just look at John chapter 11. <coughs> it's the incident of Lazarus. Um, 
verse 28. <clears throat> Martha went away and called Mary, the sister, this is John chapter 11, verse 28, calls Mary, the sister, secretly, saying, The Lord is come and calleth for me. That just gives us a little inkling of what happened at this time could be a pattern of what is to come that we will be called by somebody we know to say that the Lord has come. Now, just go back to Matthew chapter 27, which uh, records the um, death of the Lord Jesus and the great earthquake in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 52. The graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto me. So there was a great earthquake which opened graves but nothing happened until three days later when Jesus rose there were others that rose from the dead and went to Jerusalem and revealed themselves to people. And what more powerful evidence could we have that Christ has come back and the resurrection has taken place and we have to go to the judgment but for somebody that we've recently buried, if they walk through these doors, then we would know beyond a shadow of doubt that the Lord had come. There would be no argument, wouldn't there? And that could well be um, what happens. But one recently dead, coming alive, comes to say, the master has come, we have to go to. Now, how we get there, we're not told. We don't have to worry about those things. <clears throat> there are details that we reveal. We just have to know that we do need to go to the judgment seat. So, what happens to our children? Well, we have to say that God is a merciful God. Uh, and just as in the Exodus journey, uh, whole families went, they weren't separated. So young children would go with their parents to Sinai. And if my speculation is correct, that the events which uh, we're going to be looking at in a few moments, uh, do span a period of about 10 years, but then that would mean any newborn baby could at least be five, six, or seven when parents and perhaps made a more, um, then you know, the events have still got to unfold. O old enough to be handed over to uh, Jewish people <laughs> to look after and um, to bring up. There's two wonderful passages, and we had them in our readings just uh, very recently. Um, now I'm going to come to it. So. Uh, 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 Isaiah 56. <coughs> um, that wonderful picture of how uh, nations join themselves to God and the in the kingdom age. Clearly, from Chapter. Verse 6 of Isaiah 56. The sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my hands of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. Um, and verse 8, Yahweh and all God, uh, which gathered the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet I will gather others to him beside those that I gathered up to him. Seems to be an indication that there will be many Gentiles that come and are adopted into Israel, but I, I think among them will be the sons and daughters, um, uh, young ones uh, who become part of Israel, share in the wonderful things of the kingdom. And then they have their opportunity in the kingdom age and their resurrection and their judgment at the end of the millennium and if they walk faithfully then immortality at the end of the millennial age. The other one is Ezekiel chapter 47. And 
uh, verse 22, there's a similar kind of language. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you, and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. So that's, I anticipate many people want to come and live in Israel, but among them will be the children of saints. And so, as I say, they won't lose a house. <coughs> What's a thousand pounds to wait another thousand years before they're made immortal in God's uh, scheme of things and immortality that lies beyond? So, how long does the judgment seat last? Well, I don't think it's going to be an instant affair. There's an awful lot to be sorted out, and it's going to be a matter of life and death, isn't it, for each one of us? I think the judgment seat could occupy several years. And the one who will oversee it will be the angel that has overseen our life, that knows everything that we have done, right from from what we want, or at least when we're baptized to the point of our death. Now the basis of judgment, we're still in Ezekiel, let's just go back to chapter 18 or chapter 33, that very parallel chapters, but let's just take chapter 18, so we're all in the same chapter. Um, I, I think these two chapters give us the basis of what the judgment is all about. It's not a matter of ticks and crosses, so we've already got more ticks and crosses, so you're in the kingdom the other way around now. What we will be judged on is where we are at the point of judgment. And the principles are laid out in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, chapter 18 and chapter 33. But just looking at chapter 18, I'm not going to go into any detail, but we know the basis of it that uh, if a man is righteous and lawful and done good, but then turns away, then I won't remember his righteousness because he has turned away. If on the other man, on the hand, is uh, lived a dissolute life, but then turns to me, I, I won't remember that. But it will be the fact that he has turned to me. And fathers are responsible for their children, and we are all responsible <coughs> for our lives. So uh, this gives us the basis. But the judgment will be where are our minds? How in a tune are we with the things of God? And before the change to immortality for those that are accepted, obviously the rejected are sent back to their own countries, or if they be raised from the dead. Presumably they die again. But for those who are going to receive immortality, I again can foresee that there will be a period needed of adjustment. Because going from the mortal state to the immortal state is it, it, a tremendous jump. Uh, and the only parallel that I can draw is when we want to go from the single state to the married state, we have a period of engagement where we get to know each other before making that change from being single to being married. Now that's quite a, a minor example, but as you know, there has to be adjustment. Uh, and so I think there has to be yeah, the judgment seat, a lot of adjustments. In the mercy of God, we, we can't go into the kingdom and thinking, well, why is that brother there? Or why is that sister there? Many things can be sorted out. And we've got to be educated. We think we know a lot about the truth, but there's so much, isn't there, hidden in the word of God. And being able to talk with Abraham, being able to talk with Moses and say, you know, when we read that, what exactly happened? Put it out. And, you know, there's so much to learn. So I, I can see, as well as, you know, the physical 
before being accepted or rejected can take some time, I, I can see a, a period of time again before that change in an instant uh, to immortality. But that is an instantaneous effect. It has to be instantaneous. Um, so there are things that <coughs> occupy that period. Now, uh, as well as that, um, there is the larger work. Um, we, we, we can look at that in a moment. Um, the, the, these are the things that have to take place before Christ and the saints come to save Israel in what we call the, the Battle of Armageddon. Armageddon lies right at the bottom. So all these things have to take place, the return, the judgment, uh, the Elijah work, the nations then gathering, coming against Israel, defeating Israel, and probably being there for maybe a year or two before Christ and the saints come, it will appear that there is no God in Israel. And then nations are destroyed. And so, that's why I, I think there's a, a ten year uh, period of, of things there. So, let's just look um, we still summarising. There is the larger work, Malachi chapter 4. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image has got to stand on its two feet. It hasn't done so yet. Those feet are forming now. Uh, well, they've still got a bit of way to go before the whole image comes together, united. Uh, and I believe that there is a strong linkage, as we shall see, between the larger work, the larger work in bringing reformation in Israel but around the hostility of the nations. They won't like what Elijah is doing. Um, and Gog then comes to Egypt, first of all, from Daniel, and then into Israel, and say, we'll look at the sequence of all this. Uh, this will be the final stage of the drying up of the river Euphrates, when Turkey is taken on the way into Israel. Ezekiel 38 indicates our nations opposed to this invasion, the Tarshish nations and Sheba and Dedan, the Arab nations, are opposed to these things. I say Israel is defeated, the prophets make clear. Um, and at that stage, Christ comes to save Israel. Um, some of the New Testament uh, prophecies, um, first ones on the New Testament, but Daniel chapter 12, the more general ones, indicates a time, great time of trouble, men's hearts failing them for fear, a time when knowledge increases, and we surely live in such a time, but uh, even that will uh, get more and more increasing, um, shooting of the fig tree and the other trees, um, all, all these are, are things which have to happen and reach their time. Um, with the invasion of Israel. And then Revelation 17, the woman riding the beast, I believe, is a picture of what lies beyond. That's the reading we're going to take and for our second part. That the woman riding the beast reaches its fulfillment after the Battle of Armageddon. So, events in Israel prior to Armageddon. Um, so the picture in Ezekiel 38 which we're all acquainted with is sort of going up to a nation that's at rest, dwelling safely uh, having neither walls bars or gates and it, it, this period of safety will be so apparent when my people of Israel dwell safely, shall they not know it, so it will be very apparent this stage hasn't come yet but during the time of the Christ has come back in this 10 year period, we can see this uh, great uh, growth of peace and safety when Israel overcomes her enemies and dwells very securely. So we're not at that stage, Israel is not dwelling securely. Uh, maybe Israel has to act against Lebanon and Gaza and Iran. Uh, we just have to wait and see. 
Uh, it would appear from Ezekiel 38 and uh, verse 13 that the sunny Arabs, which the vast majority of the Arabs in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, and that, are in alliance with Israel. And so they have um, given up their hostility to Israel, probably because of Iran's uh, belligerent that the nations of the Middle East see the oneness of working with Israel rather than against Israel. But the interesting thing is, this is a time described in Ezekiel chapter 39 as a time of trespass on God's, on Israel's part. Let's just turn to it because it is a very important matter that we have to be clear. That when Israel is dwelling peacefully and securely, it's not because they recognise the Lord Jesus. Far from it. Don't know his name. And when all the events of Ezekiel 38 to 39 take place, when the judgments are poured out upon the Gogan nations, Israel is the new. This is how God, at the end of chapter 39, this is how God looks back, as it were, and says, explains to Israel that the time of peace and security that they were living under was a time of trespass in his eyes. So let's just pick up Ezekiel 39 and verse um, 25. Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and be jealous for my holy name. So after they've been evaded, God's going to come to save them. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses whereby they have trespassed against me when they dwell safely in their land and none made them afraid. So God is saying, you're being punished, you're going to be punished. This invasion by the Gobi nation is because you have trusted in your own strength. You have brought about, we don't quite know how, but a time of peace and prosperity, and you haven't trusted in me. So you're going to be destroyed, because you've got to be made to see that you can only trust in the true and living God. So it's a time of trespass. Um, the spirit of peace and prosperity. And verse 28, then they will know that God indeed is Yahweh their God. So this peace, time of peace, will be clearly discernible, verse 14 tells us that. Which brings us to the fact there's a lot of talk about Palestinians having their own state. Now, Okay, it cannot be dogmatic because the Palestinians might have a state but then lose the game. But what we can be pretty certain about is that Ezekiel 38 describes the nation of Israel that Gog comes against the mountains of Israel upon the people that are gathered out of the nations that dwell in the midst of the land. Now, the mountains of Israel are in the midst of the land is the very area of the uh, what we call the West Bank where the Palestinians want their states. And the Zebra is telling us that Israel dwells there. So I don't think the Palestinians will get their states. If they do, they'll have to lose the game and Israel will have to take it from them because they have to be dwelling on the mountains of Israel. And we're going to wind up in a moment, but uh, just we'll finish with this bit here. What triggers the invasion? Well, there are two reasons why the nations invade. One I call a commercial reason, given in Ezekiel 38, which is for a sport and a prime. But there are other prophets that talk about the same events, the invasion of Israel, in the terms of a religious or a holy war. As far as the commercial situation is concerned, we've seen in the past few years, haven't we, absolutely amazing quantities of uh, gas and oil which is in this region of Israel. Not all in Israeli territory, some off Lebanon, some off Cyprus and some off Gaza. But a good proportion of that gas and that oil uh, is in Israeli territory. And uh, Israel is sitting upon an absolute gold mine. Uh, at the prophecy day in February, that was the chart that I put up, which every time I give a talk I have to add other things. 
Well, since the prophecy day, the, the, the last one was the, the Tannin site. Uh, since then, we've had Shimshon, which is uh, 65 billion cubic meters of gas, which is a reasonable supply. And then just in the past two weeks has been announced the Pel Agit site of 189 uh, billion cubic meters. So that's a, a reasonably large field. And uh, that, that's somewhere off Haifa. Um, I, I cannot quite fit this map. These are the oil fields that they're drilling in and finding this uh, amount. I can't quite fit it onto the other map, but it, it fits on there somewhere. And as far as oil is concerned, the Leviathan, they have downgraded the amount of oil in Leviathan quite considerably. They had problems drilling, um, but the downgrade is only because <coughs> they can't get deep enough, they're bringing in another ship, and uh, they're anticipating that that figure will go up. But in this uh, pelagic site, they're talking about 1,400 million barrels of oil. And Israel consumes 85 million, so you know, many years supply. And then, in addition to that, there's all the shale oil, which is absolutely um, changing the situation as far as America is concerned with their own gas supplies. Prices are absolutely tumbling because they, you can get shale oil and shale gas, and America's got lots of shale gas. But uh, they're talking about 3,000 years supply of oil. Um, in these uh, various basins in Israel. Very good quality. Um, as much oil there as Saudi Arabia has. It is, I, I think, brothers and sisters, this is our signs of the times. As to an earlier generation, 1948 was the signs of the times for that generation. To our generation, it is this spoil that has been found. Um, in Israel, which is, uh, will transform and make her very desirable. But in addition to that is this other aspect of um, a religious invasion. Uh, Isaiah speaks of it's the day of Yahweh's vengeance, the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion, and uh, Joel 3, um, recompenses, retribution. Uh, controversies the contest. And so it's not just to come to take spoil the primary, that's what Russia's mainly interested in, but Europe, the papal leadership, it's a religious contest between Jews and Jerusalem. Whose city is it? That will be the contest. <coughs> and uh, Joel chapter 3 speaks of uh, this preparing or sanctifying war, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near, let them come on. And we can translate that, make holy war. It will be a crusade against Israel. Well, we'll stop there, because uh, the next bit is to look at the larger work, and we'll carry on with that.